I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. On Sunday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saw only good results from the historic agreement. Peace is a good thing, and this peace unites uh, moderate, two of the most advanced economies in the world, Israel and the United Arab Emirates, and two of the most moderate were fighting Iran and the radicals who are trying to overthrow the entire order in the Middle East, subjugate people, propagate terrorism. So this is good for peace, good for security, good for prosperity. First Thessalonians 5.3 While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Uh, I think it's good for the United States and good for Israel. But not everyone in the region agrees. Iran flat out condemned it. The Palestinian Authority called the UAE traitors, and President Erdogan threatened to break off diplomatic relations with the United Arab Emirates. Exact suspects that you would expect to hate this deal, hate this deal. Best-selling author and Middle East expert Joel Rosenberg tells CBN News Turkey's reaction to the peace deal is revealing. Why is that interesting? Because Turkey has a relationship. They have full normalization with us here in Israel. So the idea that the would-be sultan of Turkey is condemning a Muslim state for creating a full normalization with Israel that he already has, it's ridiculous and it's hypocritical. But it's indicative of the fact that Erdogan is taking his country out of the Western moderate camp into the Iranian Islamist more radical camp. And that's, that's a long-term, very serious problem. Rosenberg also believes this Abraham Accord has prophetic undertones. We watch in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38, 39, what's known as the eschatological future war of Gog and Magog is the Arab states being very calm and quiet towards Israel. Israel reconstructed, peaceful, prosperous, calm, secure, and then a Russian-Iranian-Turkish alliance forming against Israel. The Bible talks about a confederation of nations, including Put, Kush, Persia, Magog, Gomer, and Tubal coming against Israel. Now, I'm not saying the, the war of Gog and Magog is imminent. I'm saying is the trend lines of peace in the Middle East with the Russian, Iranian, Turkish axis. This is exactly where we're heading. This is the trajectory. And it's something that should cause all Christians to watch carefully and to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. President Erdogan and Iran both have their sights set on Jerusalem. Erdogan said recently he wants to liberate the Al-Aqsa Mosque and Iran wants to conquer the holy city. Ezekiel 38, one through nine. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that many people believe will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, Stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18-23, and 39-2, 7-8. And, and it will come to pass at the same time 
when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9 For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Climate change is going to mean more extremes. More extreme heat waves, more extreme hurricanes, more extreme fire seasons. My name is Jeff Berardelli, and I'm a meteorologist and climate specialist from CBS News. Jeff Berardelli says climate change is a big factor in the increased power of storms like Hurricane Isaias and other hurricanes we'll see this season. This season is on an accelerated pace, in fact, a record pace, 
And part of that is due to extraordinarily warm temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean. And part of that is due to human caused climate change. We've seen an increase of around two degrees Fahrenheit in the waters in most of the Atlantic Ocean, especially the tropical Atlantic. Warmer water is like high octane fuel for tropical systems. That's not the only reason, but climate change does contribute to it. We say climate change loads the dice for a more active uh, hurricane season. More intense hurricanes are likely because of warmer water temperatures. But we are expecting more intense hurricanes and more damaging hurricanes in the future. Vera Deli says we can see climate change at work in other places as well. So we had a tremendous heat event between January and June in Siberia, in the Arctic Circle. Um, Human-caused climate change made that 600 times more likely. The chance of that happening without human-caused climate change would only be once every 80,000 years. So it was virtually impossible. What about the scorchingly hot temperatures we've seen across the planet? This is not the first time we've seen it get to 129 degrees in Death Valley or 118, you know, 120 degrees in Phoenix, Arizona, or 125, 126 degrees in parts of the Middle East. It does happen. But there is absolutely no doubt that these types of extreme heat waves are becoming much more common than they would have been, let's say, 50 years ago or so. Uh, recently, we've seen tremendous heat waves in Europe. Uh, Lucifer in 2017, that heat wave was made 10 times more likely by human caused climate change. And just last year, again during the summer in Europe, we had two heat waves. Both of those were at least 10 times more likely because of climate change. There was a heat wave last year in Canada that extended really from Canada all the way to Japan. That was virtually impossible, couldn't have happened without human caused climate change. And so these extremes that we're seeing uh, are happening a lot more often. Berardelli says climate change is even at work in the recent locust invasions. We have seen an unprecedented outbreak of locusts in the eastern part of Africa. The evidence is pointing to the probability that climate change is contributing to locust outbreaks that are worse than they were in the past. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. California is in a state of emergency this morning because of dozens of wildfires and extreme heat. The fires have destroyed some homes and thousands of people have been ordered to evacuate. Carter Evans has more on the terrifying double threat. California's fire season arrived early and with a vengeance. 
Northern California's wine country is now among the hardest hit areas. Two separate sets of fires there burned nearly 70,000 acres in the last 24 hours with little to no containment. Some roads became almost impassable, engulfed in wall-to-wall -wall flames. Hundreds of homes are threatened by the fast spreading fires fueled by record high temperatures and even lightning strikes. All the forces are in our alignment to make this a very challenging fight. Meanwhile, homes like this one have been incinerated. Its owner, Amy Cook, had evacuated and learned of the damage on a phone call with one of our CBS Sacramento reporters. And I'm really sorry to have to tell you this, but your house is gone. Okay. All right, I'm just going to take this in. It's devastating to lose everything. We don't have anything now. Death Valley's Furnace Creek hit 130 degrees Sunday, according to the National Weather Service. If verified, it would be the hottest recorded temperature on the planet since July of 1913, which also happened at Death Valley. All of California right now is under a flex alert through at least Wednesday, with some predicting this could be one of the biggest heat waves of this decade. An asteroid the size of a car flew past Earth, nearly missing it. It's the closest asteroid to fly by our planet that has been recorded. And, and get this, astronomers say they had no idea it even happened, that it existed until after it had passed by. NASA may have updated its plans to protect Earth from an asteroid strike, but an object the size of a pickup truck about 1,800 miles away passed by our planet, making it the closest one to do so that's ever been documented. It's called 2020 QG, the asteroid that flew past Earth on Sunday, coming from the direction of the sun. And according to Paul Chodes, NASA's director for the Center Near Earth Object Studies, the agency didn't see it coming. And while the asteroid is the closest object to pass Earth ever to be reported, experts say that it's not considered dangerous and would have likely broken up in the atmosphere. However, experts say an asteroid will eventually hit Earth. Impact uh, of the Earth by an asteroid large enough to do damage at the surface is an extremely rare event. According to the report, the object was detected approximately six hours after it flew past Earth's southern hemisphere at a speed of 27,600 miles per hour. Now, NASA scientists say that the likelihood of an asteroid hitting Earth is still extremely rare, and if that did happen, it wouldn't happen until a very distant future. And right now, there aren't any asteroids that pose a significant threat to Earth on their list. However, they do point out that there are still thousands of asteroids that they have not found yet. The seven-year tribulation is fast approaching this world and the news headlines prove it. God in his grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. Jesus is likening last day's events to a woman in labor. The closer we get to Jesus' second coming, last day's signs and calamities will become more frequent and more intense. Following the rapture of all true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns us that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes a massive asteroid impact as we read in Revelation 8, 10, and 11. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. The Bible tells us a large asteroid will strike the earth in the near future and no early warning detection or system to deviate the trajectory of this asteroid will do any good. Putting your trust in these systems will not save you from the wrath of God. Only putting your trust in Jesus Christ can save you, and He is the only way. Acts 4.12 Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. More than 30,000 people around the world have now volunteered to take part in human challenge trials to be deliberately infected with the coronavirus in the hope of speeding up research into a vaccine. They're from a group called One Day Sooner, which argues that if we can get to a vaccine faster, even by just one day, we could save thousands of lives. Let me break down how this works. In a normal vaccine trial, I would go to the lab, be given the test vaccine, and then sent out into the world, and researchers would wait for me to catch the coronavirus 
coronavirus naturally. The problem is, what if it takes weeks for me to catch the virus? What if it takes months? There can be a real lag time. In a human challenge trial, I go to the lab, I'm given the test vaccine, and then scientists deliberately infect me with the coronavirus. So it cuts out that lag. The risks, however, are real. There's no known cure for the coronavirus right now. What happens if an otherwise healthy person dies during one of these experiments? We spoke to one of those 30,000 volunteers, a British teenager named Alistair, and we asked him, are the risks worth the benefits in an experiment like this? This is what he had to say. It's a scary thought, and um, obviously we need to really carefully think about and accept that things could go wrong, and they really could go wrong. And, you know, it's easy for me to sit here now and, and say, I think this is a great idea, but um, if I end up in hospital, if I end up on a ventilator, then I think I would still think the same thing because it's providing so much good, to so much of humanity that nothing I do would be in vain. Allison, the scientific community is divided over human challenge trials. Some scientists will tell you they can be done safely using young people who are less vulnerable to the virus. Other researchers say there's just too many unknowns about COVID-19. There's no way to structure an experiment safely. There's about 160 vaccines being worked on around the world right now. So far, nobody is using human challenge trials to test them. But scientists at Oxford, who have one of the most promising vaccine candidates, say they think human challenge trials could be useful in their work. This debate about speed versus safety isn't going away, and it's only likely to heat up as more of those vaccines reach the stage where they're ready for large-scale human testing. Luke 2125, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Now to a big story developing overseas. The former Soviet state of Belarus is ruled by a man described as Europe's last dictator. But now widespread protests are trying to force him out of power after he claimed 80% support in last week's presidential election. It's raising concerns that Russia may try and take control. Chris Livesay is in Minsk, Belarus's capital. Unprecedented outrage over an election demonstrators say was stolen by the president. They're demanding step down over my dead body, says Alexander Lukashenko, enforcing his opponent to flee the country. Lukashenko's refusal to step down has set the stage for a showdown with protesters who say they have nothing left to lose. Protesters savagely beaten by police. The crisis has sparked concerns from the White House. It doesn't seem like it's too much democracy there in Belarus. And widespread fears Russian President Vladimir Putin will prop up his former Soviet ally. Meanwhile, Belarus is conducting military drills along its border with NATO member Lithuania to counter alleged foreign threats. As the people of Belarus plead for one thing. We want uh, clear and honest elections. After 26 years of rule, Europe's so-called last dictator has lost his country. Government uprisings are now a daily occurrence in our world. People in just about every nation are protesting, rioting, and demanding their governments do a better job taking care of the people. A man, I believe, who is alive and well today will soon come on the world scene, seeming to have all the answers, and he will bring a false peace to the nations of the world. Three and a half years after this man comes on the world scene, his true intentions will become known. He will bring war the likes of this planet has never seen. And with war will come famine, pestilence, and death. The Bible refers to him as the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. What do we know about the Antichrist? The Antichrist has many names. The King of Fierce Countenance, the Prince who is to come, the Beast, the Son of Perdition, the Worthless Shepherd, the Man of Sin, the Lawless One. The first sealed judgment in the book of Revelation is the releasing of the Antichrist upon the earth. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, 
and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The Antichrist will be evil, yet appear as a savior. He will be outspoken and have great speaking ability. He will have a fierce countenance. The Antichrist will be extremely proud. He will not desire women. He will be a military genius. The Antichrist will be mortally wounded. He will be indwelt by Satan. He will come from a revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will control a one world government. He will control a one world religion. He will control a one world monetary system known as the Mark of the Beast. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction, and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven year tribulation in which the inhabitants of planet earth who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal, and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal, and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100 pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Ezekiel 33, 1-11 Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people, and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory, and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Just as the prophet Ezekiel warned the Israelites of impending judgment from Almighty God, the watchmen of our time are warning whoever will listen that God is getting ready to judge an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you 
will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.